implementation. So charging infrastructure for EVs, challenges in implementation. Some of them we heard in the first session, the customers were saying that they are not allowed to <laughs> install charges in their premises. So this session, we will call upon Dr. Rahul Tonkia, uh, senior fellow at uh, Center for Social and Economic Progress, and also founding advisor of India Smart Grid Forum. And uh, yeah, we have one participant who is virtual, which is Dr. Sajid Mubasir, scientist GDST. He was also, till recently, he was the chair of ETD 51, which thrown all the standards. And uh, Mr. R.K. Singh, uh, head of EV division from Tata Power Company, which has installed more than 2,000 EV charging stations across the country. And Mugesh Dadis, uh, from head, he is head of business development and sustainability and clean technology in BSES Yamina Power Limited. They also have several uh, EV charging stations in Delhi and also a pioneer in several digital uh, initiatives in uh, uh, electric among electric uh, distribution companies. We'll call upon Mr. Drohit Kaili. He is a business head of uh, Magenta Power. And Mr. Jaydeep Kambani, head of partnerships at ULU. We have a, a full forum and uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. For the information of everybody, we have more than 50 people online on the WebEx platform attending this uh, more uh, vigilantly than those who are in the room. It's a hangover from the COVID uh, situation. So thank you, uh, Veggie. Thank you, Bestcom and the organizers. And it's been a very energizing day, but a long day at the same time. So let us try and keep this interactive. Uh, I. I'm not sure if any of you have PowerPoints, or you do? You don't have PowerPoints, I, uh, or you do? Good, okay, so we, one, one, virtual. Yeah, yeah, virtual one I know will, will be required. Uh, hi, Sajid, how are you? Uh, so I should look at the camera, but you are over there for us, so. Uh, I, I, before I get started, I just want to throw out a few thoughts towards this. Um, we don't really have a means to engage with the audience, uh, especially the online. Mm -hmm. But I'll throw a rhetorical question, question, which is, how many of you think that if only we had double or triple the charging infrastructure, then I'll rush to buy an EV? And no hands would go up. Very few. Just sure. Okay. <laughs> We're biased. We're not the, the sample is a little biased here. But the larger point is, this is an ecosystem. And charging is, in some ways, unnecessary, but not always sufficient ingredient towards this. And so we have people from many different aspects of different types of vehicles. And charging, people think of it as an infrastructure. People think of it as a service. It varies based on scale which type of vehicle, two-wheeler, three-wheeler fleet, four-wheeler, et cetera. And it also matters on one other key aspect, which is this is not a fuel, like we think of traditional internal combustion engines. Fuel, we think, I have to go somewhere, and it should take me just five minutes. These are the two things people think about, but charging for a vehicle is not just, it is about keeping your vehicle full, Absolutely, but there are other aspects of it that also can, will, or shall at some point become key. First is the rate at which you charge. You go to a petrol pump and you don't have a choice that says, do I want to uh, fill my tanki very slow, medium speed or high speed? There's no differences, it's just on or off. But here there is a difference, technologically, cost-wise, and the implications for the charging infrastructure. Second difference, the greenness that Reggie mentioned, that they want to make sure that the consumers are not just charging uh, sustainably from an economic perspective, but environmental perspective. So that ties to the time of day, which is the third aspect that is very critical for any charging infrastructure design. And how these come together 
is when we think about the capacity utilization factor or CUS of any infrastructure. Now, if someone could build a charging infrastructure and have it operating 80% still, then there's nothing to debate here. But we know that the world is not like this. So if hypothetically somebody says that I have an average of 10% or 20%, which is high, well, that 10 or 20% means 150% loading or demand at one point, point in time and 1% for part of the other time. So this, this burstiness, lumpiness, which is yet another factor. We at uh, my institute, then known as Brookings India, we had a paper in 2017 on grid charging, where if you think about the um, demand on the grid, in terms of energy or kilowatt hour, it is very modest. Forget today, where we're at the starting set. Even in 2030, with 100% of sales as EV for two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler, and buses within city. Even then, the incremental load on the grid is about 4% only on an energy base. But if you now convert this into an instantaneous demand, and now the worst case scenario is everybody plugs in Friday evening, 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. simultaneously, then the grid impact can be 50 times larger than if it were spread out. So these are the issues that are there. Tied to, of course, we heard about uh, RWA is not letting people take their vehicle for, or set up the infra. So I remember the, was Vish here in the morning? Uh, his, he went viral on social media for, uh, you hear, yeah. But he went viral on social media for taking his two-wheeler up in the lift to take it to his flat because he has to charge somewhere. So charging infrastructure is absolutely necessary. It has to be safe. It has to be predictable. So that's another aspect of the charging infra. It's not just the hardware, but the software, the way you figure out where is it. Am I eligible for it? So um, Maxon is not here, but he used a phrase that I still remember from a few years ago, which was, uh, you know, he's the managing director at Magenta Power. People talk about range anxiety. What about gun anxiety? Am I compatible with the charging standard? So these are some of the issues. Then, of course, land is another issue. And rate at which we charge. Now, coming back to the last point, then I'll hand over for the opening remarks to our um, panelists. What are we planning for? Is it trickle charge? Trickle is actually the cheapest charge because you don't need special infrastructure. You plug into your home, simple AC. It will give you a couple of kilowatts. Slowly it will charge, but that's not good enough for a big battery and a vehicle to do it in six hours. So that's the trade-off. And as soon as you want to go faster, it costs more. Who's paying that cost? Are we pricing it correctly? For how long will we socialize it or um, cross-subsidize it is, is a longer-term policy question. Today in the US, the norm for public charging speed is now between 150 and 350 kilowatts. These are the standards now in the US. So are we planning for that, for public charging infrastructure? So these are some of the questions that I wanted to um, hopefully get the juices flowing with. And now request everyone to give brief opening remarks, leaving us time for some interactions and some questions that were there. Um, over to you, Mr. Mubashir. So I thought I had the privilege of being the last. Or not connected. Uh, so I, I, I thought I'd come later because I have a small presentation. But I, I will need to react to what you said. Uh, charging is an absolute necessity. Because it's an electric vehicle. It's an electronic vehicle. <laughs> but uh, without uh, charging possibility, uh, it doesn't arise. Nobody's going to buy an electric vehicle for whatever reason. <clears throat> so uh, our efforts have been to simplify it and trying to tell people, look, this thing about fast charging, about range anxiety, that's not where the real issue is. It's about charging anxiety. Can I charge at all? And how do we address that? So it is quite possible. I have a very brief presentation. 
I will tell you about uh, what's possible in, because we have two wheelers, three wheelers and small cars. They're ideally very good as an electrified platform. They have small batteries and uh, more or less all of them can be charged without trouble. So I'd like to talk about it. And, and I'd like, what we like to propose is an ubiquitous charging that uh, a charging available in the parking itself. But it's not difficult at all. You know, so, so we'll come to that. We'll talk about it. Um, are we noting? Are we noting? Well, he has his initial remarks. But, oh, okay, so I th I thought you were going to have a round it's of. It's on the screen. Uh, so do you want the other panelists to speak first, and then uh, I come in, or I can talk about this. Okay, so. So in the EV protocols, this would be called the handshake. Right, the handshake is done. So, <clears throat> online able to see that's the most important. important, important. Yeah, you're able to hear me clearly. So, I, I hope you can. I'm, I'm audible. So this yeah. uh, th this light background uh, is my context. That this is about urban infrastructure. So I'm not looking at uh, you know like uh, something uh, outside of urban areas. It's it's about uh, so that that's the background. Can we have the next slide? Uh, please move the slide. Next slide. Okay. So uh, so this today's uh, heading in the newspapers. So please help. My charging station is not talking to my scooter. So there are four major issues to address, and I think it's very simple, so I'm not making it complicated. One is this, you know, you can't see any charging station anywhere. And when you do get to them, you find that they're not all the same. Uh, sometimes they're not compatible with what you have. So, so that is one major issue you have, you know. Uh, although we have been able to develop the entire set of standards in India, uh, we don't have people following it, which is a big problem. And that's what this article also talks about. Today's article in Economic Times. Second thing, it is so surprising that what we fund is light electric wheels, and what we don't provide for charging is the same thing. There is no category of charging uh, infrastructure supported from the government or people putting up for light EV. And and we expect uh, this to be charged. You know, it's uh, eighty percent of the population to be light electric vehicles. So we need to formally look at it. Even this new three lakh uh, auto rentals, which is going to come out with the ESL, is going to do it. They have not said anything about how it will be charged. So that's a very interesting situation. Sec third item is uh, do I need to pause? Is there a issue? Yeah. Yeah. Is, am, I, am I audible? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, we will yeah. we will yeah. quality a little better so there's less feedback because we do have two or three streams in parallel. Uh, thank you for your patience for that. Yeah, it's not very clear to me. Should I repeat or? Uh... Okay, so the I think we moved on a little bit. I think, can you go back to the early slide? The problem is okay. So the third thing is uh, what we call as the DC charger, Bharat charger. There are no more vehicles being uh, manufactured for them. They have stopped. People have stopped manufacturing these vehicles, but uh, every rollout seems to be about Bharat DC chargers. So that's very surprising. So there is a, there is a uh, so there's a third item. Fourth is uh, for the bus and truck charging. There is just no plan. Just no plan by anybody. Uh, so these are the four issues I like to address. My slides will talk about that. Let's have to the next slide. Uh, the solutions. Yeah. So this is a summary of it. The the coming in the next slide, the what will come up is you know I will elaborate on each one of them. 
first solution is to go for certified charging devices, which means devices which are as per the Indian standards. So all this talk about fires and stuff like that, you have to remember that none of these devices are charged, you know, certified. So you can, of course, have investigative committees looking into the battery and the vehicle and all of that. But uh, it, to me, it's quite obvious there must be something about the charging devices which is creating a problem. None of them, at least for the which has been certified. Uh, so one or two are, but that like most of them are not. Second thing is to roll out the infrastructure. We have excellent guidelines from the Ministry of Power and the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. So that can be utilized for creating a very affordable infrastructure model. Third item is uh, uh, we could uh, we must uh, plan all smart devices, you know, because uh, uh, here you're talking about uh, grid relationships, supporting the grid. So all these devices have to be smart. A fourth is uh, this issue about uh, the right consumer right access to power. That is also to be uh, you know upfronted. This has got to be done. So next slides, I will spend a few minutes on each slide, and then you know. It's, it's quite a small presentation. Please go ahead, next one. Right, certified devices. It so happens, I thought Mr. Rejipale or someone will talk about the devices we have standardized. We have four power levels. Power level one is all light electric vehicles. That means two wheelers, three wheelers, quadricycles. We have the entire set of standards and the methods of uh, doing that, both AC and DC. But uh, you know these things are not really utilized yet. Then you have a power level two, which is you are able to charge cars in your car park because that which power is easily available, quite adequate. In fact, up to 20, 22 kilowatts of power can be provided to a car, which is which is almost fast charging for uh, an Indian car, which would be having a battery of similar size, about 25 kilowatt hour battery maybe. So that's a power level two. Power levels one and two, you can easily provide uh, in a retail fashion all over the place. So that's one thing we need to kind of work out. And uh, third is, uh, of course, your highway uh, charging stations, these big stations, which, which is currently being deployed. That is, of course, uh, level three. And level four is a specific set of bus charging solutions developed in our Indian standards. One is a panogramic solution. The other is a dual gun charging solutions. These things should be brought forward. You know? So these uh, a standard, uh, you know, the key point here is people who purchase the devices must ask for certified devices, like you ask for ISI plug and all of that at home or wherever. Uh, so that is a major transition. We need to ask for certified devices, which means it will go through all of that. It will be very safe kind of a thing. Uh, so th that one. Next slide. So I'm deliberately making simple points very clear. This is the one is about certification. Second is how do we get to uh, a, a dense uh, deployment of uh, EV chargers? There are two things which are going to help us. I mean, this is beyond what the private sector would do by themselves. But le let's look at uh, the Ministry of Power guidelines, the latest guidelines 2022. It is very good because it still retains the focus on employment, entrepreneurship, development, that's that's in the first page, the guidelines, right? Uh, and uh, it, it now gives a focus for dense deployment. That, that's the other point of written number four, that uh, they're very serious that the government land available in different places, in all organizations. There has been circulars going out, uh, we have got letters here. Every government institution to uh, enable, uh, you know, like EV charging. So, and, and then that is supported by the Ministry of Housing Urban and Guidelines that 20% of parking should be for EV charging. Now, these are the same thing, according to me. I am not looking at charging station. I will not recommend charging station. Uh, you see, like, it is not like a petrol pump. It's not like there is just no need to go anywhere. The electricity arrives at your house. You can charge it there. So, this is a particular opportunity we have. The Ministry of Power and Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs Guidelines that you can really access a whole lot of uh, real estate across the country to be able to install the charging devices. And if you're looking to install charging stations, there is no scope. These are not the places where people are going to drive up to and charge and all of that stuff. That's not, this is not like a, a public petrol station. These are uh, like, for example, it's one of this must be my office, you know, like, uh, so there will be a car park there. 
20% of the car power can be kept aside for charging and you don't expect to put a heavy charger out there. You'll put a small medium power charger for people who are residents, people who are working there, or maybe nearby people to kind of, you know, like generally, generally for the population which is at risk, people who are staying or working. So that is how this model can be kind of built out. Basically about parking, bringing the uh, charging into the parking, whether it's a two-wheeler or a four-wheeler. It can be done from the normal electricity distribution itself. This enables that because the guidelines allow you to do that. There is an incentive and, and, and everything can be kind of put into place very easily, provided we give up the fancy about this fast charger. There is no need to do fast charging if you're at home or if you're in an office at a car in the car park, or even if you're sitting in a movie. Why would you want to fast charge? Because your movie is going to take three hours. So these are medium powers and it's easy to deliver and we should give up the fascination about fast charging. It's too expensive, not required. There are no vehicles which requires fast charging because the batteries are so small. The biggest vehicle is just the one, you know, BYD is kind of showing around. Uh, that is only up to 70 kilowatts of power. Your fast charger will love that. So there is no need for fast charging. And when you see a need, of course, you can put it up. At this point of time, I think we should put up put a halt to these fast chargers and just have chargers around the place. So uh, I can talk more about it, but I don't want to right now. And let me go to the next slide. Right, here is the choices. I want to just give you an example of this new fancy vehicle, which has come BYD, because this vehicle has three options. I don't know which one they brought to the country, but it can have a tiny, let me say bonsai uh, uh, onboard charger, six kilowatt. If you're going to use that, it's going to take the whole night. 12 hours to charge. So that is AC charging. Then this vehicle also can have a 40 kilowatt onboard charger. If that is the option on the vehicle, that's fantastic. But then you have to provide an outlet where they can plug in. So we, I don't, it's not too difficult, but you have to configure for that. Or you could have a 50 kilowatt DC charger, which is a rarity because it's a very big installation in terms of because no one puts a one 50 kilowatt charger. It will be a farm of many things and that Kind of takes the cost too much. So my suggestion is this, and that's what we are talking about here. If we just give a DC interface to the vehicle, then that six kilowatt charger, you don't have to put it on the vehicle. It is a portable charger. It will use the same interface as your 50 kilowatt charger, DC charger, or if you happen to put a 20 kilowatt charger in the parking, the interface is the same. The cost of the vehicle will come down because you're not putting an unnecessary charger on each vehicle. So we could transit towards a scalable set of DC chargers. That is a six kilowatt portable one, a 20 kilowatt parking lot one, and a 50 kilowatt that junction big thing out there, which you know is a fancy one. We hope maybe it'll come someday in future. It's not happening really. So the suggestion is if we could go for a DC interface, it becomes easy and we are talking about uh, now four, four different levels. That means if you have a two-wheeler and three-wheeler, you go to the first level. If you have a car, you go to the second level. And, and you know, you can even go in between uh, because it's all the same interface. So the way, if you take that view, then charging is all about the last meter of the grid. And it's about destination that you arrive someplace, plug it in, and that's what how charging would be. It's quite simple to deliver if you don't go for a fast charging. And these places where vehicles are parked is exactly the place which will allow you to load management, time of day tariff, and, and all that means you can delay the grid upgradation. And of course, if it is that situation, then you can integrate renewables as well because these are parking lots. Uh, the rooftop renewables and things are quite accessible there, you could do that. So essentially, parking is to char equal to charging is the paradigm we need to go. Fast charging can wait. When that is required, we can look at that later. Please go ahead, next one. And all of this has to be smart charging. There must be electronically controlled communications, all of that. And if that happens anyway, the moment you go for a DC interface, it is smart by definition. You don't have to do anything particular. Communication is already out there. And then the last point is about this as a consumer right. If the government is insisting people should buy electric vehicles, then it is the government's right, the power sector, the Ministry of Power agencies sitting out there have to ensure people have the power. And which actually means getting the power to the park, parking lot. Access to power is that is the issue. Asking people to bring power from their own residences into the parking lot is not, uh, it is not advisable. It, it won't work. 
you need to give a separate connection there. And this whole slide is just about that. If you want a dense network, then you need to do something in the regulation that allows car parts to be managed by professionals. The same guy who gives tickets to the you know, parking ticket, he might add 20 rupees more because that's all the power that will be required. Even if you charge for two hours and two, three kilowatts of power you take, that's about the money you will require. So the definition like in, in France or other places is like, uh, or in or in the European Union, that's the kind of a thought you have. It should be within walking distance. You should leave your car and, and it, it's not really in your campus itself, but within walking distance. That could be defined as something like 200 meters or whatever. So wherever you are, you should have access to something within walking distance, a point where you can plug in the vehicle. It will remain in the charge. You can control it, all that stuff. So this is the destination charge that you arrive at a destination. It could be an apartment where you're staying, you're coming home, or you reach your office, that's your destination, or you go to a mall or some place, and that's where you charge. So all of that, if you want to kind of do that, then the access to power, we, are talk, we can talk about kind of about 100 kilowatts per parking area if you can deliver. If you can provide that, then this will enable employment generation, people who work on it. So it's not like a new installation. The existing parking, existing connection, and the existing guy who's managing the parking, they all get upgraded through some kind of in-situ charging solution. Easily scalable because multi we have the technical wherewithal and the solutions to say different kind of cars, whether it's the OCCS or GBT, they all can charge from the same point. We have worked it out, and we can even say auto rickshaw and scooter can charge from the same place. Auto and car can charge from the same place. It's all about the interface. If we can sort out the interface, it's quite quite easy to do that uh, because the basic premise is if a vehicle arrives at the car park, they should not be refused. So from that point of view, these things can be sorted. The technology is not too difficult. It's about providing the access to power. It's about considering the car park as a place to charge EV. So next slide, I think that's the end of it. Yeah, so this is a summary, yeah. a summary of the things. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mbarsh. Uh, will you be able to stay for discussions? Uh, I know we were running a little late. Sorry, we're not able to hear you. Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly. Okay, so then I won't ask my follow-up questions immediately, so we'll save that for the discussion. But I did like your point to emphasize, one, there's a leapfrog opportunity, because we're still to build a lot of infrastructure. And second, we have to do matching. We can't just have one size fits all. We can't have just one standard. It's you talk of four levels. There can be um, not just these four levels, but also different business models associated with these. So these are things we'll talk about. Uh, I'll hold off one point for, for the discussion. I'd now like to turn to, um, we'll go in the order uh, that's listed. Uh, uh, Mr. Amkrishna Singh, uh, please share your opening remarks. Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, um, do we have another microphone, please? Hello. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. And thank you, BESCOM. Uh, thank you, ISGF, for giving me the opportunity to be on this platform. And uh, I would also like to thank you for the noble initiative you have taken for you know, sensitizing the public at large to come at single forum on take on the EV related issues, challenges, find out the solution so that you know, society at large can benefit in India. So primarily Tata Power has been instrumental in setting up the charging infrastructure in home segment and public charging this segment in bus segment. And I would like to share the perspective from the you know, implementation point of view, because uh, in last two years and primarily in last one year, we have already added almost 2,000 plus public charging points. And also around 500, 600 are in the, into the process. And we plan to add another five to 6,000 charging points in this coming financial year, that is 22-23 apart from bus charging across India and home charging. So what are the key constituents which are you know, uh, 
required for implementing the EV charging infra. So if we talk about mostly, which is talked about is public, it's primarily uh, you need hardware that is connector and car. Then you have a, a digital platform through which you can connect, communicate, understand. You have the power requirement. Then you have the network availability, network in the sense power network, communication network, both. Then we need to have the payment gateways, taxes and duties, and also the location, which is one of the most talked about uh, you know, a requirement. So if out of these uh, six, uh, you know, primary constituents, I would like to focus, considering the my experience in this domain, uh, is uh, one is the power requirement, which is predominantly required for setting up the uh, public charging 25, 50, 100, 200 kilowatt. It takes a lot of time for the, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, processed through uh, any discount. Suppose if you are applying a power connection in most of the government discounts, you need to set up the um, power infra, say distribution transformer. Suppose you are taking 25 kilowatt connection, 50 kilowatt connections. So barring few discounts, most of the places you need to set up the uh, distribution transformer, some line, some uh, cables, that takes a lot of time. So if discom can take the initiative in that uh, they will facilitate and be agile in providing the power connection. So I think that can be, you know, uh, uh, faster adoption can happen and faster rollout can happen. That is one part. Another important part is communication, network communication, which primarily uh, may not be available at all the locations. Suppose you are driving, say, from A to B location, say, Pune to Go Goa, and you need to connect that which is the nearest charger while you are on route. In some places you might find difficulty because of network is not available. You also need to know that whether charger is available or not. So in case communication is down, so even though charger would be available, but the customer or the EV owner find it difficult that whether he should stop, go to that charger or should not go to that charger. So that is another important part of, uh, you know, requirement. Another important part is uh, user itself, because what is the, uh, as a habit, we go to a petrol pump, somebody will, you know, come, put the gun in your car, fill the, you make the payment and you go. In case of public charger, it is a uh, unmanned. So when it is unmanned and you are using the application or some swipe card or so, you know, some scanner, so many a time I, uh, we are getting many calls that they're not able to process the charging system itself. So even though there are instructions available on the application, even on the charging stations, but they find it difficult. So we need to make them, you know, educate them, make it more, uh, maybe more customer friendly. So that is another uh, important part that customer needs to be educated that how, uh, how the, the charging would happen and uh, we need to come out of the mindset that somebody would be available at the charging station. So that is, uh, that is another uh, my focus area that how do we make customer or user aware that uh, is a self-service concept. And then uh, uh, another important part is the location <clears throat> wherein uh, we need to uh, have that public-private uh, partnership wherein the uh, government uh, locations can can be utilized for the uh, this EV charging infra. Similarly, societies, in fact, let me share you the numbers. Uh, uh, like we are putting the home charging services for Tata, Nexon, and Hyundai, and around 1,000 plus requests are pending for the want of society permission. The gentleman who was there today, in the afternoon, he was discussing. So this is the kind of you know awareness we need to have across uh, you know segments. So apart from this, uh, uh, this location, is another important part is uh, that uh, uh, how we make this entire uh, you know integrated effort and a common connector. I would uh, you know have an analogy from the uh, metering uh, background. In 2002, there was a APDRP. 
that time the all the meters were different so vedi and mr murugeshan are you know well aware so that time when the all the meters were different a lot of infra was put in but they could not measure the improvement or the loss reduction and then it came rapdrp so that most many of that investment gone into the dustbin in fact so if we can have a common connector across the segment say i have a bus charging infra in say kolaba so whether bus charging infra can be utilized for the public uh, uh, the public charger for the nexon for the mg for the uh, this jaguar so as of today the tcs2 is being used by nexon jaguar mg while buses are using gb by t many of this uh, two wheelers have different uh, set of uh, connectors so this is the one of i find it is one of the key and very important requirement to that whatever infra investment we are doing today uh, has to be standardized otherwise many of the investment could go into the drain i was traveling one day from mumbai to pune and i could see some of the chargers i would not name the company but they are just you know junk because they are of leak just you know almost a year back there was might have been some junk so uh, that is the kind of uh, requirement we need to you know see that how do we uh, this is a public or private money has to put into effective use and resources are scarce and limited thank you thank you um we get to these points uh, i mean in more detail but i think for point on interoperability is a very key one uh, which comes back to the expectations uh, the old joke from the networking space was it should be plug and play not plug and pray so with that in my, uh, mind if i could now turn to mr dadit uh, so you will be the person that a charging company would come to uh, and say that i'll need a probably an xc connection so how long should that take or of course delhi is not the rest of india so that's the caveat that i will you know um, throw uh, throw so thank you dr rahul and uh, thank you bestcom and isda for inviting us to share and our learning from the capital city of india and uh, today i was very excited to hear in that big hall my different dignitaries that bangalore wants to become the ev capital of Sir, india if you could bring it then they can lower the volume yeah yeah so similar voices we hear in delhi as well and we are happy that more and more number of cities are being competitive in terms of promotion of these ev and ev infrastructure particularly so we are uh, the discom operating in east and central part of delhi and uh, i do not claim but uh, yes i can say that uh, probably we were the first company to have public charging in at least in delhi because uh, in today's session mr chetan meni was speaking and uh, he introduced reva at around 12 13 years back and uh, our company provided uh, around 15 number of free charging points for common people so probably all these things were ahead of time and could not pick up at that point of time and so again 3 uh, years back we provided first of Uh, public ev charging station in east delhi and that was established by bscs and recently we have come up with a smart ev charging station that is again in the uh, first of its, its kind in india so uh, doing our bit apart from our normal role of providing uh, ev connections as far as mr uh, ramakrishna was mentioning that uh, discom role in providing or extending electrical connection to these ev charging station is very very important and we also feel that we have to play a key role into that and that's why um, in our company and uh, today I was, i was very happy to hear that uh, bestcom is also doing the same thing they and they are today inaugurated this single window system for uh, applying for ev connection and separate ev teams uh, dedicated ev teams for the connection and other things so we are already doing that side and uh, one request to mr rajiv kumar here that uh, 
maybe we can have a forum of the comms where we can share our experiences uh, in terms of our tracking or sharing our learning and experience in the field of providing EV infrastructure among the discoms because there are already a lot of concern why I'm listening to different speakers from the morning and uh, obviously there has to be uh, a greater role of discoms and uh, maybe very degree of uh, uh, processes and applications and uh, we talked about the standardization of processes as well among the different utilities. So yes, I agree and uh, I advocate about uh, more and more interaction between the utilities and uh, if any sort of extent, because uh, one CPO like Tata Power has to install EV chargers across different st states and they cannot, uh, I mean, uh, the different formats, processes and charges are same across the different states, then it will be easy for every CPO and other things. So this could be easily done, I think. The second aspect is that uh, Karnataka was, of course, the first state to introduce the EV policy. And uh, later on, the other states followed. And in Delhi, it was introduced around three, four years back. But uh, these policy incentive supports and other things can play a little role, or maybe to some extent only. Ultimately, it's the people. If they will see the value in anything, then they will pick up. Uh, I can give you an example. At the time when the e-rickshaws picked up in Delhi, perhaps there was no policy support, no incentive, nothing was there. And it was flooded all over Delhi. I don't know what was the driver or who was communicating to them that adopt EV. There was no Rezigwan, no Dr. Rahul, or no EV forums or anything. But they adopted this solution because it was user friendly, it was economic and easy to drive uh, and easy to handle. It was increasing their output, work output, and uh, uh, perhaps the income as well. So it has to be in that fashion only. And uh, again, uh, the Delhi has been very progressive in all this, re uh, this regard. And uh, recently, we have concluded uh, the public EV charging for. Uh, to government tender, where uh, at the government locations, uh, we also provided our some of the, our locations as, as well. And uh, again, it was the first of its kind where we discovered the lowest EV charging tariff in India. And you could you will not believe that it is two and a half rupees per unit for slow AC charger. So, if the market is so competitive, and people are so eager and excited. So probably uh, it gives us the belief that this thing will really fly. And uh, these EV charging stations should come up in a big way. And discoms are always there to help and support. I will only urge the CPOs and the OEMs that while you plan the location of each other, especially with the high load, maybe in the category of 100 kilowatt plus, Prior to that, if you have the option of selection of location, then probably consult the discom because there are different pockets already stressed where the network cannot provide extra juice for this kind of, and probably that may take a little longer time in terms of extension of lines and transformer and other things. So probably joining hands with the discom and or utility by the CPOs we can find some sort of solution where we can optimize the location of these charges by combining the business prospects and the electricity infrastructure cost and other things. My other point is that although it's good that the EV ecosystem is getting some promotional tariff and other things. But ultimately, the thing has to be sustainable. We can have these things of four rupees tariff or four and a half rupees tariff, which is below the average power purchase cost of utility. For a time being only, maybe for a couple of years, you can wave off the fixed charges and other things. But ultimately, the socialization of cost is not a good idea. At the end of the day, it has to be cost reflective for every category and other things. 
So we expect that soon the business of EV infrastructure will pick up and slowly these kind of promotional policy support, incentive support and the tariff and other things will become realistic and the EV business will run at its own. So that is my wish and uh, I wish all the best to uh, all the CPOs, OEMs, manufacturers that uh, we commit our fullest support and uh, the good part is that this home uh, uh, is also taking interest in terms of installation of EV chargers. Bescom has come up with their own set of uh, EV charging application, mobile application. So probably uh, discoms are uh, best players in terms of interoperability and other things. Tomorrow we can see that uh, even at the end of the day, it's a sale of or service of electrons only. And the discoms are best players in this business. So maybe through the bill adjustment or other things, like I am an EV owner and I am the connection holder at my home as well. So why should I pay? at two places for the same electron I am getting in my vehicle or at my home or something like that. So can it be clubbed and something could be done like that to provide more ease and comfort to the consumer. And why should we have a number of mobile application into my mobile if I am having any EV to get it charged through Fortum, Charge On, Magenta, Tata Power, ESL, and number of companies there. So it will be good if these people can talk to each other and provide the easiest solution to the consumer. The last point is that uh, the data, which is very important and uh, for, from the utility perspective as well, as the load of uh, the EV charging will increase. We have around 12 megawatt of load only from the e rickshaw charging in our company. So as more and more number of chargers will come up, definitely they have their own left load pattern and other things. And as uh, we concern that uh, whether it will be contributing to peak load or not, that is the main concern and where the question of uh, the utilization factor around comes. So our, uh, especially in case of Delhi, where we have very peculiar load curve, the difference of minimum and maximum is already in the range of four four times, the minimum, maximum load is four times of the minimum load of the same day. So it's a vestige of resources. My old uh, transformers lines are essentially running at around 40%, 50% average loading during the year, just to serve the 0.5% or 1% of the load for peak load. So this will put extra burden. So smart charging, scheduling, IoT devices, and the TOD, so energy storage, how we can support the EV charging by not investing into network expansion or augmentation. That will be the key going forward because it's going to be in the landlocked city areas, we are still facing problem in terms of expansion and augmentation of network. So how will these new charging station will be accommodated, accommodated in terms of electrical supply? So Again, the coordination between CPOs and all and the other stakeholders is very, very necessary. Thank you, Rao. Uh, to your question, uh, that ST connection. So from the experience that getting ST connection is a, you know, a lot of task. Even in my discom in Odisha, there is a regulation that you cannot take two ST connections in a single premises. And I am following up with the now regulator because this, uh, discounts are you know bounded by the regulatory commission's okay. directive. Right. Okay. Uh, so what I request uh, maybe I through ISDF and you can take up with the government and uh, okay. so, oh. right right. So even MOP has issued the guidelines in January. But uh, it has not come to the uh, directive uh, through yeah. regulatory commission. So, yeah. each state yeah. regulatory commission yeah. immediately issued the orders issued by the MOP yeah. within certain timelines. Yeah. For uh, for this yeah. 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 within a week, yeah. the connection is to be given. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, that is true, but uh, it is a basic requirement. That is a that is a from the corporate point of view. If you go as a home individual home charger, you know, uh, car owner, so new cars are coming with the 11 kilowatt AC home charger, seven and half kilowatt AC home charger, and they would like to get their load extended to that extent. And then again, you know, similar challenges would come whether juice is not there in the network. So uh, that is that is to be you know the serious uh, issue. That's a really an uh, issue because there are different regulations, rules, policy across the states, and CPOs are facing this issue. And because they cannot appoint one expert to deal with uh, the utility in the Assam, then in Delhi, then in UP, then in because the person working in UP cannot work in Haryana because the rules and uh, the formats and all things are different. So yes, standardization is very much required there. Uh, Uniform is yeah, 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 so that is required. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you flagged another point that is itself a whole separate debate is on the business models and there is a session tomorrow on that. But the larger point I think is we worry too much about this last 50 pesa or one rupee when the problem is not that comparing it on a per kilometer basis. Because even at let's say 10 rupees as a round number, just for argument's sake, per kilometer that's just a little, you know, one and a half rupees ish for a four wheeler. And so, that's not the bottleneck. It's getting it predictable, getting access. As Dr. Mubarshi said, these are the things that really impact consumer mindset, as opposed to that 50 pesa differential, uh, probably. Uh, with that, I'll uh, now request uh, Mr. Kelly to share uh, opening thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Rahul. All right, so I represent Magenta. Uh, we are a 2017 green energy startup. Uh, we are the few ecosystem players uh, who are basically an integrated ecosystem player. We are an EV charger manufacturer, we are a CPO operator, and we are an EV fleet operator. So basically, uh, the entire ecosystem, I make a charger so I understand the issues with the charger. I read in the uh, online presentation which was there that most of the chargers which are being implemented largely through the government schemes are all old technology chargers, practically redundant today. They are extremely difficult to put on your network. That they barely... false L1, that same issue of that chasing the false L1. Chasing the false L1. So communications on those chargers are extremely difficult. So we've, we've broken our head onto that and it's been a fair bit of task. Uh, and I'm a user as well. So when I set up chargers, charging stations, I have a fleet of about 400 electric vehicles which use these charging stations. So uh, as a user, I understand the pain areas. My users are the drivers. These are not people like you and me. So the charging systems, the chargers have to be abuse proof. They have to be weather proof. And uh, something which I would like to pinpoint, uh, taking from something which you said, chargers need to be very, very reliable. Uh, we, uh, as, as Magenta, we see charging as, as two separate uh, segments largely. So our focus areas uh, is into commercial electrification and personal electrification. We believe at Magenta, uh, the intra-city commercial uh, mobility will lead the way uh, because that's captive market. Uh, this is still uh, a controlled market. And I think economics drives everything. It's very fancy to say uh, go green, but till the time if it makes money to you, people would not switch. So commercial uh, for two-wheelers, commercial three-wheelers, four-wheelers, there's all, already a positive PCO for commercial operators to operate these electric vehicles and make an economic sense out of it. 
I believe next one or two years, commercial segment will lead the uh, the mobility segment, and I'm sure the infrastructure will fall in place for the retail to fall back on it. Uh, within commercial sector, because I'm also a user, reliability plays an extremely important role. We service clients like Amazon, the big baskets, which work on a 99.99% .99 customer satisfaction score. They are looking to deliver products in less than 15 minutes, which means my fleet needs to be capable. My charging infrastructure needs to be supportive enough of these fleets to deliver these kind of service levels. So reliability plays an extremely key role. Uh, as I said, uh, there are a lot of players in the market with very low standardization on chargers. Uh, you could practically go on any charging infrastructure provider, be it mine, be it Tata Power, be Fortum or anybody. I can very comfortably say, uh, please pardon me if my statistics are wrong, but at least a positive figure of 15 to 20% of all chargers on a network would be down on account of non-communicating chargers, on account of downtime of maintenance. So if I as a user land up at a charging station and I see the vehicle can't be charged, I'm practically left with nothing else but to tow the vehicle back. So reliability is extremely key, even more key for players like me who run and operate fleet operations. That's one. Uh, I would not like to dwell too much into uh, the challenges we fail, uh, face with best forms. There are challenges, but uh, I see there's an upward trend that we are, uh, the, the, the complexities are getting eased out. We currently run a, approximately 10 captive fleet charging stations across Bangalore, which give us uh, a, a cumulative output of about 400 charging, fleet charging uh, infrastructure at Bangalore. And uh, things are improving. We have, it took us a year to set up this. It could have possibly done in six months. But I, I see there is a definite improvement. Uh, there is uh, a positive curve from the best forms to assist the CPUs to faster implementations on these projects. I would also like to dwell uh, very shortly on something which was taken up during the discussion on standardization. So as CPU operators who are the early... Yeah. We are less powerful than Mother Nature. <laughs> would, you, would you be able to pick up if you bring it very close? I'll, I'll yeah. try to do that. All right, thank you. So I was talking about standardization, uh, you know. So as early adopters, as CPO people, as startups who are investing heavily on CapEx to set up these charging infrastructure, Charging technology is still very, very suspect. Uh, we, we charge a lot of commercial vehicles. We charge on a DC001 charging uh, technology. Uh, the passenger vehicles which are coming in the market are all on CCS type 2 capabilities. We have now heard that Maruti is getting into electrification and they are possibly coming up with Sedemo. So complexities at our end as a CPO operator to invest into these high cost charging chargers, which is a huge capex cost to set up one charging infrastructure, is going to be a complexity which I don't even have an answer on. Uh, but I think it's an evolving market. Uh, I surely see there has to be some government play on standardization. Uh, those will be my two, three takeaways on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one key point I think was what's going to drive the early period is niches. They're big. I mean, I like to remind people that a niche in India is bigger than countries in Europe. So the commercial users have already a viable business case. Um, ISDF had done the pioneering work on for a lot of fleet uh, buses. Uh, it's already cost effective. There's not too much debate. So these are very key, but then we cannot just think about those. Uh, it's like you said, everyone needs to have that comfort level to get to a point and say it's working and I can charge there. So, Rahul, uh, just adding on to that, you know, so on the retail segment, uh, non commercial segment, uh, the statistics would talk about about 80% of the charging still happens at home or offices, you know. 
that's the easier play that's the predictable play most of these places would generally have the necessary loads uh, which is a huge challenge for us to secure loads uh, uh, and, and this is where utilizations are almost guaranteed for operators like us it's not like setting up a charging station on some highway where i don't even know where this one vehicle is going to land for a charging so home and corporate would be an 80% uh, retail charging uh, uh, option which magenta already has a fair level of play a big part of this is slow charging ac level charging complexities are lower what you are talking about is open charging highway charging uh, opportunity charging which is where tata power is a very key player and i'm sure complexities are much larger there Thank you, Mr. Shelley. If I can now request uh, Jadeep Kapani to share uh, his opening remarks. So I guess uh, the, the industry needs to be louder, and I think that's the sign that we are getting. But uh, good evening, all. Uh, first of all, thanks, Raul, and thank you, Mr. Reggie. A wonderful presentation. Uh, some of it uh, we have a lot of key takeaways. for BSES and uh, BESCOM and very soon I'm moving to South Mumbai so, so uh, hope to be there working with you but uh, just to give you our perspective right so at Kulu we are uh, the largest fleet operator on the low speed electrical vehicle side right and uh, in the first session we are the gentleman who had a major problem setting up a charging unit uh, and I think that's the problem we solve I'm saying hey don't set up a charging unit we work on battery swapping, so uh, either way. But uh, see, uh, today I think we've got, I echo a lot of sentiments out here, but, uh, and one point I want to bring across uh, out of the three is reliability, right? So today uh, I am worried. I am only worried because it started raining. And the moment it rains, I know my network will be down. And I'm not talking of my communication network. I'm talking of the electric network that powers my charging units. I am worried, but I know uh, as discoms, uh, they are trying their best. But that is something that actually worries us as fleet operators, because a downtime of two hours pushes uh, the availability of battery, right? Which is very important. Today, I serve uh, not only a personal mobility segment, which is someone like you and me uh, connecting to a metro station, a BMTC location, which is a bus stop or an office, which is within the three to five kilometer radius. But I also serve the last mile delivery. And why that is important is a personal user today covers about 15, maximum 20 kilometers in a day. While the last mile delivery guys cover almost 100 to 120. Uh, and in terms of impact, that's the impact that will actually make to the environment, right? Uh, even as a fleet operator that we see, uh, today, to you know, if I need to put 50,000 bikes in the market, and by the way, in the next eight months, we're putting one lakh. So if I need to put 50,000 bikes, uh, instead of getting 50,000 consumers, I know I'm working with some of the bigger companies on last mile. 50,000 is not a challenge for me, right? So I know numbers go on the market, they go on the road, they make the impact in terms of, uh, you know, pollution. Uh, but more importantly, that also, I need to maintain a network out there. Uh, which is why it's important reliability. Uh, the second point, like Mr. Reggie mentioned, today uh, we are setting up our charging network and uh, we've done 3 million swaps till date. On a daily basis, we're doing 10,000 swaps across this two and a half cities. Uh, why I say two and a half cities is we cover Bangalore, but we are present in Mumbai and Delhi in a very small area, uh, you know, less than 10 square kilometer. Uh, but we operate a fleet of 1,000 bikes out there itself. Now, uh, in all of these locations, especially in Bangalore, I need to take a connection of 29 kW. Only because the moment I hit 30, I need to pay for a transformer, right? Uh, so that's one of my biggest challenges. Now, what that actually converts to is the fact that with a 29 kW, I can only operate X number of units, no matter the space that I have. And real estate is one of the most expensive components for us, right? So I'm not able to optimize real estate, simple. Uh, point number two that I want to make, right, is also in Bangalore today, 
I've got two units that are charging 2,000 batteries in a day. Uh, we call them cloud charging. Uh, again, I need to take 199 kW there. Why? Because the moment I hit above that, the transformer cost becomes three times for me. Right, so the setup cost itself is more than three times. Uh, plus I have a lead time of nine weeks. Nine weeks to set up just from the time I put in papers to my discom to the time I see unit running. Now nine weeks is a big lead time in such a business. Uh, right, uh, nine weeks, no supply chain issue. I would have already been rolling out almost 10,000 bikes a week. Uh, and that's my supply line that I already have. So I think two of the major issues, uh, all of us, it's good to see all of us are, are sitting together. Uh, I'm sure we're sharing these points, but I'm also hoping that we follow up on them, right? I'm more than happy to work to see them conclude uh, and bring it to an execution level. Uh, and that is something also very important to us. So, uh, and the third point that I want to bring, uh, and that's I think my last point, and thank you Ringos, I think I'm audible now, but uh, you know, the third point I want to bring is see, we're talking about swapping, we're talking about interoperability, we're talking about all of that. Uh, but who's looking at creating an ecosystem around that? It's the discom, it's uh, the charge point operators or the fleet operators. But somewhere my ask from GOK or Government of India is the fact that land needs to be more available. Today I operate on a micro-mobility fleet which charges 2 rupees a minute. I cannot pay 30,000 rupees a rent, plus pay discom, uh, plus pay for transformer costs, and plus look at downtimes and look at generator costs, right? So the whole business model needs to be viable. Uh, and I think that is something that we need to look at, that two major inputs, land, power, get them together, get them accessible, get them reliable. Uh, and I think this industry will thrive, right? We're seeing everything that is pushing the industry upwards. Uh, I'm sure like any other industry in the nation state, uh, and I'm not, I've not been in the industry like some of y'all. Uh, I've just been pretty new here, right? So, uh, but I can still say that I think the signs are there. Uh, we are probably also one of the fastest growing EV fleet uh, I would leave aside some of the bigger developed nations. They've been doing it for certain years, but uh, I think we need to sit together. We need to get this executed. Uh, I think that's very important. So that's, I think I would end it there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And I think this is a key takeaway if we could take for BESCOM and for ICF and, uh, and other stakeholders, is let's really sit together to understand the uh, heterogeneity that needs different solutions, because it's not just the levels that uh, Dr. Mubashir mentioned. Um, thresholds issue, like sizing and so forth, is, is just one of N uh, that, that we have to work through. Um, I'll, there's so many questions, but I know we're uh, already in, in time. How much time do we have for five minutes? Five, okay, great. So um, I, I know you have to leave for a flight soon. Um, so, uh, I, uh, I, uh, Mr. Rajesh has a flight to catch. So, just uh, one question. You, 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 you brought up this point about these, uh, for example, RWAs. So, it seems like apartments are, of course, the big growth in urban areas. Even though MDUs are still, multi-dwelling units are common, uh, where houses get converted to three stories, four stories. But for apartments, can discoms think of some new way of preemptive planning, because that is a concentrated point. See, it's not just this 100 kilowatt story or 200, it's also the feeder. And as soon as you say the word feeder, all bets are off, it's not nine weeks. If you think you can get a feeder built into Old Delhi in nine weeks, uh, you're a magician. So I think this question really begs, one, how do we differentiate, and second, related to that is preemptive planning. Today in an apartment, one fellow says, and I think Dr. Mubashir's point was spot on, you don't want to extend the residential connection for the EV. It should be a separate connection. But now, one person takes it or two people take it, they pay for it. That's what the RWA, my RWA says, is your problem. But at some point, we will reach tipping point, critical mass, where you actually want a common trunk infrastructure, where the spur to your vehicle could be paid by the end user. 
how far away do you see that future or what can be done for that sort of thinking but as soon as you enable it it's a chicken and egg thing then people will jump towards evs and then you will have a discom level issue to think about your own so uh, i'm very happy to share that uh, can you bring it closer sorry it's uh, yeah. yeah so at least in this part of delhi we deliberated this issue with the uh, high rise societies and rwa for around an year along with the different cpos and oem so that uh, what could be the possible business model for these societies because essentially they do not want to have that kind of public ev charging system within their society due to inherent region region of safety and other things and uh, the present position is that they only have one or two users out of 100 users so uh, probably he only wants with that connection for today recharge. today today yeah so i am coming to that so uh, raul probably you will be seeing the first solution within a month on ground as we are entering into an agreement with one of the societies where we will be leasing the land from the rwa within the society is near to our subdivision and we will be partnering with say, some third party cpos who will be putting the charging uh, infrastructure there and uh, we will be charging directly from the user it will be the flat owner so it's a model of community charging so individual charging for every flat owner in and the society where 250 300 flats is not possible you can write it so there is no question of providing each and every connect, ev charging connection to every flat owner so it has to be community charging solution whether it is closed boundary society it could be a dds society or some uh, colony or something like that so we are also exploring the solution where we can install some uh, community charging at our substation at the fencing of the substation uh, you can also call that curb charging where uh, uh, the restricted users will be there essentially the residents of that particular section of land so we are very close to work out the solution only thing is that uh, how cpos and oem can collaborate with us and help us because definitely there will be no clear cut business case in to that you will be putting capex for the connection for the charging infrastructure knowing that there is only one user in the society and he may or may not charge there because he probably uh, he may get the charging infrastructure in his office or somewhere else so that kind of risk we uh, we will have to take but it has to be taken we have already left behind that uh, chicken and egg story and it is well said that uh, charging infra has to come first so we have to provide this thing into the society it could be in the phase manner initially you can have two chargers only or one charger then as the number of vehicles increases in that society you can keep on adding that and uh, improve the uh, kilowatt is and ac to dc conversion as well so first we have to start begin with so step in i request to all the cpos to step in into this field as well i can very well collaborate with uh, five societies with every cpo operating in delhi part and probably they can uh, help me in sorting out this problem thank you thank you um uh, we have actually dr mubashir had his hand up he was patiently waiting um yeah so can i just come in and we'll, we'll come to you mr amkrishna uh, just a minute oh, you also have a flight to catch uh, in that case dr mubashir can i uh, request I you to one, thing. one minute brief. more not not a very long thing very brief i'm very comforted to hear bescom's intervention i just want to point out one thing that i'm so surprised and uh, not so surprised in another way that none of the panelists seems to be aware of uh, the indian standards so let me just present that at the end of it in the mop guidelines the latest one 2022 we have two annexures annexure one is what people are still holding on to that is that uh, bharat charger and things which are not standards annexure three the next page if you look at the entire set of standards have been published for, for everything in two meters ac dc connector uh, protocols everything 
uh, everything for DC charging, Chattamoosis is all of that. So I am just inviting that people should look at it. Uh, so that's the only thing I want to say. Thank you. Point well taken, Dr. Mavashe. Um, I think that awareness will grow, gradually grow. Um, just one follow-up question to you from your opening remarks. You said that consumers must ask for certified uh, OEM hardware. And that requires a level of awareness and willingness to bypass this L1 or false L1 mentality that begs the question, should the government not be taking a harder fist on clamping, clamping down on uh, the issue? So I'll hold that question uh, for just a second. We'll have a group photograph um, because some of our participants, uh, uh, panelists have to uh, catch a flight. Um, So I think I can quickly come to the answer. Shall I do that? But you were able to but join, the, able frame to join the frame uh, without Photoshop. Uh, any last, any quick last, word, quick last, word, quick last, last, word, quick last, 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 So, uh, so I, I've left the pointed left the question point to you. Uh, yeah, that's that's my key point. You see, it's like this. I think uh, just having line? just having magenta there is good enough for me to kind of communicate. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, the audio was not working. Could could we could we reconnect? Can you hear? Can you hear now? Are you able to hear? Okay. Okay. So, uh, I'm assuming you can hear. So, the key issue is this, if you want certified devices, what it means is you're certifying against the standard, right? Uh, so, that is possible only if you go with Indian standards. The CHADMO CCS are all Indianized, the connectors, the communication protocol, everything is there. Of course, we go by the international standard, we don't call it CHADMO, we don't call it CCS, we call it System A, System C and all of that. And uh, the DC charging devices at uh, the two-wheeler, uh, at the medium level, everything is standardized. We have these standards. So if you go for, for certified devices, like for example, I don't know why people are still using these uh, Bharat chargers. Those vehicles are kind of vanished. No, they don't, nobody's making it anymore. So these devices, if the ARA is willing to certify, we are willing to help out in the process. Uh, so if people be aware, people can insist on buying certified uh, devices then it would be an entirely different thing. There are a whole lot of things will get opened up. Uh, the manufacturing of that will come up. And there is just one more thing I wanted to say that we are also looking to do a project involving uh, major CPUs and, uh, you know, like users like this, of downsizing the DC charging devices to Indian sizes. It's about 20 kilowatt, 25 kilowatt power. And we have the standard for it. If you do that, deployment becomes quite easy. All these issues about, uh, you know, getting your own transformer, all of that vanishes. It becomes, you're using your own car park. I mean, I'm not talking about individuals. So the, all what I said happens when you have a downsized effort. So it has to be proven. We have a method we would like to kind of prove it. We're starting a project. And uh, an option for in infrastructure socket, that means whether it is CHADMO, CCS, all of that, at that power level, the same socket can provide that. So that is the invitation 
Bharat, Bharat, uh, Indian charging standards and uh, deploying them in some places, at least in Bangalore or some place we could do an experiment, show people that it really works uh, and a certification program. Thank you. I think uh, ubiquity of standards does take a bit of time, but they achieve a feedback loop uh, shortly. Um, we are nearing the end of our session, but uh, any sort of wish list or, uh, you know, so, so we, we know that there are challenges, but challenges are part and parcel of an evolving and growing sort of space. Uh, from a policy perspective, um, what would you list out? I mean, we already have the recommendations of uh, not just standards, but also uh, sitting together to get the heterogeneity and the mixes right to set up uh, improvements to the policies, uh, including the regulators. So I think that's another key stakeholder that we would need. Uh, of course, the uh, chairman was here uh, earlier. Any sort of uh, th thoughts, either closing or wish list, either? My wish list don't end. But I think uh, there are a lot of challenges, which is why we get paid to sit here. So uh, that justifies it. But I think one thing that I really want to put on the top of everything being a battery operated vehicle and on the battery swapping network side is the fact that availability of affordable power. When I say affordable, I'm not talking of the tariffs because we understand that is not going to be you know permanent, right? Uh, what I'm saying is when I want the power connection, the cost in terms of time and in terms of money, that is something uh, that I think tops our list, right? So today uh, we are willing to, you know, understand how the ecosystem works and we're willing to pay the price there. But what we only request is a good enough affordable power available uh, at location, right? So I think that's what tops our list. How much backup power do you end up needing percentage-wise? When you say backup power at each location? Yeah, diesel or yeah, certain locations or anything. No, we don't take backup power, and that's the challenge. That's the challenge. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm operating at 199 kV, right? So I have a property of 3,000 square feet. Uh, I barely use 30%, but that's the kind of property I need to get that kind of power. Uh, putting a diesel generator just makes it worse. Uh, and it's not affordable, right? So, uh, which is why this tops our list. Rohit? I would actually have very similar wish list, uh, uh, similar challenges. I think as a CPU operator uh, and one of the bigger ones in the play, uh, with possibly all contacts with the best comms, it still takes a lot out of us to set up that one charging station. Uh, and as I said, we are largely into commercial fleet charging. Uh, the sizes of our charging infrastructure are fairly large. A typical charging infrastructure would be catering about 40, 50 vehicles charging at one time. Uh, and as of now, we are talking about smaller vehicles. These are LCVs, which consume about 3.3 kilowatt. We are still talking about 150, 200 kilowatt hour kind of loads, which we require at these places. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, so similar to, I, we would, we would, for startups like us, time is the main essence. If it takes three months to six months to set up something like this, and I have to just put something in inference, we have about 10 charging stations today. I think only one gets powered by an EV charging connection. All nine run on commercial uh, 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 connection, which is a self kill for us because if I procure my input cost of electricity 10, 11 with all the slab charges, that's the cost I can't even charge. And fleet operations are very thin margin operations. I don't charge 20, 22, 25 rupees per unit like what a startup power would do, would still make it viable. EV charge units at 11 rupees, 12 rupees, 13 rupees, so very wafer thin margins. So to get an EV connection for a company like me, which is a professional CPU in itself, I think gives a fair picture of where we are today. And I'll leave it there. I think there's a long road ahead but I think we are taking the right baby steps towards it. Thank, Thank you for having us here into our perspective. I, I just have to follow up. So just to understand, you have a connection. So the physical infrastructure is already there. It's a question of converting it 
or when we typically scout for a location and uh, as like for fleet operations we don't have the uh, flexibility of opening a charging system anywhere it has to be in the vicinity of two or three kilometers to the operating hubs of these principles where we operate these vehicles so an amazon hub they have 20 such hubs across bangalore big basket would have another 20 png would have distribution centers as well we work with these clients so my fleet operations have to be in the vicinity i scout for places I don't find any place which has more than five kilowatt existing there. So from five to 200, it's a big journey for us. Uh, my lead time for the day, my CPO project team says we have identified a location and signed off on the papers is 90 days before I see that, okay, that thing will be up and running. That's the kind of lead time the business takes. Uh, and I think that's the opportunity. That's very rightly said. That's where we both are here. If it would have been so easy, it would have been plug and play uh, otherwise. No, I think the discoms are really doing a lot and they're, we're taking steps towards streamlining it. But the flip side, and I'll close with this thought, today you have just a handful or you know, relatively small numbers. These numbers will only accelerate like mad. Let battery costs come down post one or two years for post COVID and all of these things. At that point, the demand will be far higher, so I think the work will be cut out for the utilities as well. Um, Rana, last, just last wanted, word. Yeah, just wanted to add to that, right? So we're all in small numbers right now, right? Uh, one of the challenges that we see or foresee is the day my fleet comes, and it's not going to be one or 100 vehicles at a time. It's 2,000 vehicles a week, right? So at that point of time, if I start setting up my charging infra, it is still three months away, correct? So uh, unlike maybe, you know, on the, the personal mobility side where I know that I'm going to probably be rolling out 100 vehicles at a time or 200 vehicles at a time, here the numbers are huge, which is why it's also important that these lead times also come down. And also, I think I just want to close. So I think the bottom line is scale, speed and scale, and then sustainability of trying to make the electrons green. Speed, sustainability, and scale are the buzzwords uh, going forward, and Karnataka has you know, been a pioneer. Uh, it has manufacturing hubs as well. Uh, and so we, we look forward to seeing much more action uh, and, and, and achievements in the coming years. Thank you, uh, BESCOM. Thank you, ISGF, uh, and everyone who's joined us online and live. Uh, Reggie, uh, over the to you. Point which you said, uh, it's only very recently, it came to my knowledge early this year only that some states don't give connection more than 30 kilowatts in LT. I was always in Delhi and uh, Bombay and uh, places where they, we give more than 100 kilowatts, no problem. <laughs> in my house, if you need 100 kilowatts, I get it, no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't need to go for HD connection. So I didn't know it. I, I came to know very recently. So immediately, first thing I knew that every state I made some phone calls, some places 115, some places 50, some places 60. And I was shocked. 90% of the country be below 100. So, and, and uh, I, I knew the only place, MOP cannot do anything, one state government cannot do anything, PMO cannot do anything. Only place to go is Forum of Regulators. I requested for a presentation to Forum of Regulators, which has not happened. Unfortunately, the previous chairman retired in June. Uh, well, next week there is a FOR meeting, but uh, I'm not getting a slot there. So, but very soon, within next two to three months, uh, we will present it, we will argue. And uh, there are a couple of more points also. From the very beginning, our position and what we have been arguing every uh, places in the policy makers is that benefit of electromobility is not just for the users of the electric vehicle. It is for the entire society because no pollution, no sound pollution, and which is a great advantage for a man on the two-wheeler or a three-wheeler or a pedestrian or on a cycle. No fumes comes. Otherwise, in it, I am on a two-wheeler, I am standing at a red light. Imagine the amount of uh, the pollution comes to me at that point, which is not there, no sound. So everybody is benefited. And as I mentioned in my presentation, I didn't have time to go through it. Why? As a standalone business, charging station don't make money anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Every country, there are some way or the other, they have been incentivized to do that. Do that. Either free land has been given or something or the other subsidies, grants, different things happened in everywhere. So here we, we made different recommendations and uh, 
we we want to make sure that uh, more and more private people come and do it one very interesting example is that of canada some uh, eight years ago when ev started catching up the eastern side of canada the toronto area uh, that region the state said that uh, this is a private business the market will decide so they, they didn't uh, when i go set up a charging station there are not many ev ev is not there and there is no business volume so private will not come since charging stations are not there people don't buy car so it's a chicken egg situation but on the western side when you go to vancouver there the uh, policy makers said that no we should the, we should mandate the utility to create charging station everywhere and that will go into their uh, capex which is into arr and it makes only very few uh, few paise or few cents per kilowatt hour of electricity is nothing and they did it. so more charging stations in vancouver in 2018 compared to the electric vehicle so that the look at both sides today both, both the places it's going up so same way we always said that uh, yeah. world leader yeah so, so now we here we have been telling regulators that uh, every year the discoms arr may there should be at least minimum 100 200 500 charging station that should be part of it and uh, when discom does it is unless you go and ask for a connection from sir sir will say okay mere mere ko it's transformer badal ke mera 150 kilowatt kva ka transformer tik chal raha hai do saal ke liye mere ko change karne ki zarurat nahi aapko 50 kilowatt connection dene ke liye you have to go for a new one why should i do that you pay for it i mean that is if business metrics are like that but when he want to do that he will say okay it's just 150 i will shift it to another place where the load is only 30 or 40 I'll, I, here I'll buy a 500 kV new transformer. That kind of a capex when he gets it from ARR, that is one which will work. So, so this is something which we can advocate. We will continue to do that. We'll at least this connection. Everybody should be given 100 kilowatt or 175 or some number will come. It's not going to be 30 anyway. One of the lowest for that matter, sir, 30 is in Karnataka. And, and moving to another thing, the point which you said, it says nine weeks. He says 90 days. 99% of the regulators of my age group. When I say my age group, we grew up in India where a telephone connection took 8 to 10 years. A Bajaj scooter took 20 years to come. Maruti car took 15 years to come. So for us, if you say 90 days, it's enough. <laughs> so that point, I cannot go and argue. <laughs> and when you talk to the tech companies, 90 days is an eternity. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so just see, the world has changed. The world has changed. Nine weeks is too much. It's a generation. <laughs> so, uh, when you go to tell anybody in, sitting in a secretary level or a chief minister level or somebody, nine weeks so I say, "Chale, yaar, kya mera kudte?" Ek vacation karke wapas aaja. Okay. So, so we'll have to look at both sides. Thank you, thank you very much. Sorry I want to thank that. everyone and especially our panelists and Dr. Mubashir online uh, for very. Stimulating, electrifying maybe, but also uh, kept us engaged at the end of a very long day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.